get to a category that's kind of, it seems like they're in between the two. But we'll dig deeper and find out that they're actually, according to Allah, they're just another category of disbelievers. They're actually just an extension of those who don't believe. And this uh, popular, the popular term for them among the Muslim community is the hypocrites. People who say one thing and do another, right? Now the thing is, the previous two groups, everything is very obvious. The one who believes is obvious, and the one who disbelieves is obvious, because they demonstrate what they believe. But this category of people is complicated. And that's why you'll notice in, in a couple of ayat, in just five ayat, the matter of the believers was made very clear. In a couple of ayat, the matter of the stubborn disbeliever was made very, very clear. But when, the, when it comes to the munafiq and the, the hypocrite, there are exhaustive ayat. And some of the most complicated examples given in the Qur'an are given here. Uh, by the way, somebody, if you can close the door, the sound is distracting, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Also, probably children will be wrestling eventually. So, it's... At-tab'u aghlab, you know. So, but in any case, so this, this is the most complicated uh, group that the Qur'an talks about. And it's the most, like, exhaustively talked about group. There are several ayat about them in this surah. There's going to be ayat dedicated to them exhaustively in Surah An-Nisa, for example. Surah Al-Ma'idah deals with them to some extent. Then you've got a huge chunk. Actually, I even skipped Ali Imran. There's a piece of the, about them in Ali Imran. You've got an exhaustive discourse about them in, in Surah Al-Anfal, then again in Surah Al-Tawbah, then again later on in Surah Al-Nur, Surah Al-Munafiqun. I mean, over and over again, this group of people is talked about and talked about exhaustively. But it is a very complicated subject. It is not a simple subject. And Allah intended it to be so. Because it's, He kept it complicated for a reason. What goes on inside of these people, first of all, it is complicated. They're not in one situation. La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula mudabdabina bayna dalik. They're not quite here, they're not quite there. They're kind of caught in between. Sometimes they have a good day, sometimes they have a bad day. They're, they're, they fluctuate. So you can't put a finger on it. It's kind of like a, a patient who, who's, who's, whose disease shows up sometimes and other times he looks perfectly happy, perfectly healthy. And you're like, this person is not sick at all. And then another day they're just completely like, they can't even get out of bed, you know? And so it's very difficult to diagnose that situation. Now this is important because the, the attitude of the Muslims, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the subject of nifaq, of hypocrisy for in light of the Qur'an, just some things about it. Because even though it's a, it's a complicated subject, I felt it important to give you an overview because it's the first time Allah is going to talk about this group. Uh, because you know for Muslims, we kind of use these terms too casually. Just like what yesterday I talked about, we use the term kafir casually. Qur'an uses it very specifically, we use it very casually. Same thing with the word munafiq. Allah uses it very specifically, very targeted and very serious term. And we throw the word out for just, you know, you're hearing a khutbah about hypocrites and you're like, yeah man, my cousin, seriously, he's such a hypocrite. And you're like, in your head you've already got a picture of somebody who you want to label, you know. So we're too casual with this very, very serious term. So just a couple of comments about the seriousness of the subject. There is nobody talked about in the Qur'an that, is, that calls for more anger from Allah than this group of people. There is nobody in the Qur'an that is described with worse punishment than this group of people. إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ The hypocrites no doubt are in the lowest of the stages of hell. And the lower hell goes, the worse it gets. And the lowest of them is reserved for munafiqeen. So when you decide or I decide to just call somebody a hypocrite, it's not a small thing that you just did. That's actually far worse than even kafir. It's actually far worse than kafir. The, the, the level to which Allah Azza wa will describe His anger towards these people is not something small. That's the first thing to note. And it's important to note the difference between someone who's got weak iman, they're not doing so well, they disobey Allah here and there, things like that, and they're trying to get better, and a hypocrite. Those are two very different things. They're very, very different things. The second thing I want to talk about is nifaq, hypocrisy at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and our time. You have to make a distinction. It is absolutely necessary. I'll make this subject easy for everybody to understand. Can you compare my faith and your faith, my iman and your iman to the iman of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu? No, there's no comparison. The sacrifices he made, that Umar made, that Uthman made, that Ali made, that you know, Usama bin Zayd made, these Sahaba who made these, these sacrifices, who lived this Qur'an when it was first revealed, what they accomplished and what they went through, we can't even begin to imagine. This was the best of generations for a reason, because the hardest of the missions ever given to a human being was supported by these people. Rasulullah had the hardest of all missions ever given, 
And these were the people that had backed him up. These were his crop that helped him carry that mission. These are the greatest of all people. In other words, when Allah talks about the truest of believers and the greatest of them, there are degrees, right? Every generation has their sabiqoon, but really the asbaqu sabiqina is that generation, that first generation, right? And they're the best of the best. The same way, their kuffar, their disbelievers, the, like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, you know, or in the Quran, people like Fir'aun even. You're never gonna get a Fir'aun again. You're gonna get people that come close. But you're not gonna get a Fir'aun again. You're not gonna get a Ana Rabbukum al A'la Taib. I mean, this guy earned the kind of accolades that even Shaitan would want his autograph. He's up there, you know. Abu Lahab is no joke to be an uncle of the Prophet ﷺ and then curse him. To be an uncle of the Prophet ﷺ and then celebrate the death of a baby. <laughs> you know, this. So you're gonna have bad people. You're gonna have enemies of Islam later on. But nobody's even gonna come close to the fact that an entire surah would be dedicated by his name, Dabbat Yada Abi Lahabin Watab. It's not gonna happen. You understand? So that their best are far, far above our best. And their worst are far above our worst. There's no comparison. The same way, their hypocrites are far worse than any hypocrites that will come after them. Because that situation, they had the opportunity to receive guidance from the best of all human beings directly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In addition, they were in the company of the best generation there ever was, and they still didn't take advantage of that. You and I read the Qur'an as a book. They didn't read the Qur'an, they heard the Qur'an. And they heard the Qur'an from the voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's a world of a difference. What they did not take advantage of. Anybody who comes, I'm not saying hypocrisy died. Hypocrisy continues. Nifaq continues. But the level to which they were munafiq, nobody will ever be munafiq. You understand? So when Allah Azza wa talks about it, there are degrees. And so when you quickly jump the gun and say, well, here's the ayah about nifaq. Here's the ayah about hypocrisy. I can think on, of who it applies to. It doesn't apply in the same degree. It doesn't apply in the same degree. And there's a massive, massive difference. We have to be sensitive to these differences. So that's the, the, the second comment that I wanted to make as an introduction to this subject. The third comment that I want to make. Again, introductory concepts. So our thinking about the subject is clear. All of this based on the Quran itself. The third of these concepts is Allah Azza wa went out of his way to keep the hypocrites a mystery. Even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out of his way to not name them. To not name them. Refused. The worst of them, every Sahabi knew. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, la'anahullah, everybody knew. There was no confusion that that guy is not just hypocrite, he's hypocrite public enemy number one. He, this guy was the worst of the worst of the worst. He called himself Muslim, he joined the ranks of the Muslims, and I should tell you a little bit about his story, because if you're gonna study hypocrisy in the Quran, you gotta know this guy. That's like, you get, like if you're gonna study Kafir, you better know Fir'aun. Right? If you're gonna study Munafiq, you better know Abdullah bin Ubay. You need to know. If you don't know all the others, you gotta know this one. This guy was actually part, a, 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 a citizen of Medina. And Medina was made up of two major tribes, Aus and Khazraj. Khazraj was the bigger one, and Aus was the smaller one. And Aus, you can say, had they all together combined, they had eight counties. You can think of them like counties nowadays, okay? One of them had eight counties, the other one had four counties. How many counties altogether? Twelve, right? He was, you can say, the governor of the biggest county of all the twelve counties, part of Khazraj. First of all, he's from the bigger tribe. Then he's head of the biggest county, biggest family within them. And he's in charge. And the people of Medina decided, before the Prophet came, before Islam, they decided that we have all these different districts, we have all these different counties, we should unify all of them and create Yathrib, meaning the previous name of Medina, as a kingdom. And we should name one unanimous king. And they started inaugurating who should we pick among us, and they decided that the governor of the biggest district should become the king. And so that was going to be who? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was, he was actually inaugurated as their king. And so they started preparing a throne in Medina, in Yathrib. And an inauguration ceremony to celebrate the appointment of their first king. This is the situation of Medina. And just literally days before he's supposed to be signed into office and take his oath as president, if you will, the Prophet ﷺ arrives in Medina. And the, when the Prophet ﷺ arrives in Medina, all this district and king business is done. The political campaign is over. 
it's completely washed off because now the unanimous governor of Medina is who? Is Rasulullah over the Muslims and even the non-Muslims. His entire political career disappeared in a flash. And you know, when somebody loses, after winning the election, they still don't get the presidency? That's going to that's gonna rub you wrong a little bit. And then the one who cost, cost you the presidency, they, you're not going to really like him that much. But he had two choices. One, he could become direct enemy and you know, create his own party. You know, like if some people wonder if Donald Trump doesn't get the, the Republican nomination, he might run as an independent, right? So he, you have the option of just taking your own. Let me see who's loyal to me and let me make my own group and then fight them and then see who comes out on top. But he thought, he realized that actually all of a sudden, even though the majority used to be with him, now the majority is with who? With Rasulullah So opposing him is definitely a losing proposition. If I oppose him, there's no way I'm winning this election. So if you can't beat him, <laughs> join him. So he accepts Islam because that's the only way he can stay with the winning party. And he's hoping, if I didn't get the presidency, maybe I can work my way up to the vice presidency. Maybe I could do that much. The problem with that was, the Prophet ﷺ, the closest people to him were the ones that made the most sacrifices. And the ones that made the most sacrifices were people like Abu Bakr, Umar. These are people from Makkah or Medina. They're people from Makkah. So now, not only do we have a foreigner king, his closest associates are all foreigners too, immigrants. And you know when you're from, a, uh, Arabs in particular at that time, and even today, when you're from a region, you think about the politics, the, the leaders of that region should belong to where? That region. Every politician even nowadays, even if they're running from a, for a local district, I'm a fellow Texan, and I'm from Tarrant County. You know, like, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna emphasize how local they are, isn't it? But now all of a sudden, the leadership of Medina belongs in the hands of a group of immigrants. And actually, not only Rasul himself, literally, by the way, they're called Muhajirun, which means immigrants, right? They're the ones who migrated. And the head of them is a migrant, and then the closest ones around him are also migrants, you know? And he's trying to fit himself into the vice presidency, he doesn't get any room. Because the only way to get close to Rasulullah is to make more and more and more sacrifices. The only way, to, you have to prove yourself. These people have proven themselves for well over a decade. The people of Medina, but that hasn't even happened yet. No tests have happened yet. So he's got no way to show his political importance. So what did he used to do? He used to actually show up to the prayer, every prayer early. And he used to be in the first row in every prayer, especially Fajr. And if the Prophet ﷺ would ever make an announcement, he would get up right before the Prophet ﷺ and say, People, listen carefully, Rasulullah is about to speak. And he would, then he'd sit down. Because you know, he missed the mic. And now the mic belongs to who? To Rasulullah So at least he gets to be the MC. <laughs> Nobody invited him to be the MC. But this way, at least he gets to see that people won't forget my face. They'll still see me in the public eye. So he needs to show constantly. And then he had to come to the Prophet ﷺ. He hated the Prophet ﷺ. He hated him, obviously, why? Because the Prophet is the reason, ﷺ, that his political career came to an end. You understand? That's why he hates him. But still, to show the people, he has to go and sit next to the Prophet ﷺ and convince the Prophet of how loyal he is and how well he means for Islam and all of it. But you know, the thing about politicians is they can give big speeches. But when it comes to sending, going to war, for example, do they go to war or do they send the young sons and daughters of the land to the war? They send the poor, by the way, they mostly send the poor people. They don't even send their own kids to war. They send everybody else's kid to war. When Badr is about to happen, because he's actually genuinely a politician, is he willing and eager to join the battle? No, that's, that's not his thing. His thing was politics. His thing was not sacrifice. Sacrifice is for the lower class. He's from the elite class. He's from the upper class of Yathrib society. But Islam comes and there's no more upper, upper class and lower class. Everybody's Muslim. And he's standing there. And by the way, when, you know, leaders of tribes back in the day, when they came, people greeted them. They gave them special chairs. You know, even nowadays, you have class society in many places. They have special places to sit. You don't have like the truck driver and the CEO sitting in the same place. And we have this mentality even to this day. To this day, so many parts, sadly, even of the Muslim world. When you go, you have a clear class society. 
You have people that are wealthy, they're going to have the, you know, the elite car and this and that, and they have their drivers that are just walking around opening the door for them and this and that, and they're not even said salam to. People don't even say salam to the Muslims, and they don't even say salam to them, you know? And you have this like VIP, I saw this, it was so disgusting. I went to a Muslim country, went to Jumu'ah, and in Jumu'ah, the first three rows, they had like this kind of security line, VIP section. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't have a VIP section. How do you have a VIP section? The entire purpose of making rows in the prayer was that the black and the white and the slave and the free and the poor and the rich and the sick and the, uh, the, the healthy, the young and the old, they stand in one row, they left everything behind. That was the point. But for some people, getting that class system out of their head is very difficult. For Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, it was very difficult. And people around him also, it was very difficult. Because this Islam came and it gave these immigrants the status and one day he's standing there, next to him is Bilal. You know, next day, another time, is next to him is a servant. Not even an immigrant, a servant of an immigrant. Standing next to him in prayer and he's like, well, why should I be? You know, you know these are aradiluna, badi ar-ra'i, Quran says. These are our riffraff. This is the second class. What are they standing next to us for? This is what people of the past, the kuffar used to say to people like Nuh alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam. We want to listen to what you have to say. The problem is you have these low class people around you all the time. If you want to come to a four star restaurant or something, we can sit in a nice ex executive setting. Maybe you come into my office because I don't want to come into your poor neighborhood and talk to you. It's beneath me. You know, this is beneath me. This is the attitude that they had, they, they brought towards the prophets. So this is one category of hypocrite that I wanted to introduce you to. People who accepted Islam, but they didn't accept Islam because they were convinced of Islam. They didn't accept Islam because they loved Islam. They accepted Islam because this was the only way to keep their political career. Hoping things will turn around eventually. You know they say, keep your, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies. Closer, right? So that's what the, the idea was. That he's going to keep. He's going to keep his enemy, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi closer. Even he's going to keep him closer. Now, that's one category of hypocrite. But these ayat that we're about to get into, the beauty of them is that Allah azza wa jal is so vast in His speech, and He's so all-encompassing in His speech that multiple groups are targeted with the same statement. This is part of the beauties of the Quran. Look. You have, I'll give you an example, in, in a classroom, you have students and different students have made different mistakes. One student failed the test, another student didn't do their homework, another student comes late, another student is disrupting the class. There are different crimes within the classroom. And the teacher says, some people here are in big trouble. All he says is, some people here are in big trouble. When the teacher says that, who is he referring to? He didn't make it clear by the way. The teacher did not make it clear. Or even if the teacher says, one of you is in big trouble. And he didn't specify which one. Every one of them who's been up to no good is thinking, oh my God, that's about me. The next one's thinking, that's about me. The next one's thinking, that's about me. You understand? So sometimes the wisdom in speech is to keep things what? General. So that it applies to the maximum number of people. The first group of people is the hypocrites. And I gave you the example of the leader among them. There's another among them, another category of hypocrites. These are people who accepted Islam, but they didn't realize that they were signing up for something very serious. In other words, I'll give you, an, there's a big difference between that Islam and this Islam. Big difference. When somebody accepts Islam today, maybe somebody lives in an apartment by themselves, their parents have passed away, they're alone, and they decide that they just go YouTube some videos, they watch somebody's video, they saw Sheikh Yusuf Estes or something, or watch something from Mufti Mank, and they say, hmm, Islam is interesting. And they start watching a few videos, and they decide they want to become Muslim, then they Google the closest masjid, they go there, take shahada. They become Muslim. What, how has their life changed? Their life has changed because pork is gone, alcohol is gone, now they're starting to wake up really early and pray. Some changes have come in their life, yes? But back then, I want you to understand, in Medina, when somebody accepted Islam, it wasn't just that their diet changed, or now they're going to fast in Ramadan, or they're going to pray five times a day. You know what it meant? It meant that they are joining a campaign, a struggle, and they are directly offending Quraysh. They are becoming enemies of the biggest tribe in Arabia. They are declaring war against the most powerful force in the region. Only by taking the Shahada, it was an act of loyalty to Islam, which means it was an act of war against Quraysh. It's going to come with consequences. Isn't it true 
that the Sahaba, who, the, the people of Makkah who accepted Islam, didn't they get in big trouble? Why did they get in big trouble? They weren't tell, you know, even halal and haram food hadn't been revealed yet. Most of that time, five prayers haven't even been, been revealed yet. Laws of riba were not revealed yet. Fasting was not revealed yet. Clothing restrictions were not revealed yet. Nothing of the things you think about when you think of Islam was there in Makkah. Almost nothing of it was there in Makkah. There was no fasting yet. There was no five daily prayer yet. That was much later in Makkah. There was, there was no clothing restrictions yet for women. There was no prohibition of alcohol yet. Nothing. Why are they getting in trouble? Because when you accept Islam, you've declared your loyalties to the Prophet ﷺ, which means you have undeclared your loyalties to your tribe and who they worship. It was an act of defiance. So when you accept Islam in that day, basically you've joined a military. I'm putting it simply to you. Basically you, have, you are ready to join a military. You're not just accepting a religion. You're joining a movement. Now the thing is, these people saw this religion, it makes sense, there's one God, there's this beautiful revelation, beautiful words that we've never heard before, all of it makes sense, it appeals to my inner self, it appeals to my inner nature, this is something that just resonates with me, it's a rational faith, I'm going to accept, my heart you know, uh, connects with this faith, I'm going to accept it. But then call came for spending in the path of Allah, migrating in the path of Allah, fighting in the path of Allah, Quraysh are coming, and now you better prepare a military. And the Prophet ﷺ is going to ask for these people who just accepted Islam to join the, the army. And they're like, we didn't sign up for this. I just, I just wanted to pray. Uh, I like praying. I like recitation. You know, I want to fix my tajweed and stuff. But this whole Badr business, uh, where did that come from? I'm just a farmer, man. I don't even have something to fight with. And most of us, we don't even have swords. You want us to go into battle? I mean, if you study the number of swords at Badr, <laughs> It'll tell you how much military background these people had. Just the number of swords. For the, the, the meager militia of 313. For these people even to be mentally willing to go and fight. You understand what, the, what was being asked of them. So what I'm saying is they accepted Islam genuinely. But when they realized that Islam requires a lot of sacrifices. Serious, serious sacrifices. Of money and of self. Then they decided to take a few steps back and say, I don't know if this is for me. I'm not so sure if this is the best thing. I mean, before this life in Yathrib was pretty easy. This is making things complicated. And who was there to gather those people and make their doubts even worse? Abdullah bin Abay bin Salul. He had his political reasons for being a hypocrite. But he could prey on the ones that were weak in their faith and gather them around him. You understand? So these two groups of people make up the munafiqun. They go from weakness of iman to straight into nifaq, to hypocrisy. Now there's another two groups of people that I want to talk to you about before we get into these ayat. Very important. As a matter of fact, the Jews of Medina were divided into two categories. The Christians are a separate phenomenon. Predominantly it's the Jews that I want to talk to you about today. The Israelites. They're in two categories. One of them has already been talked about the heads of the rabbis who recognized the Prophet ﷺ immediately. They recognized he's the messenger. And when they recognized him, they got terrified. They were terrified. You know why they were terrified? Let me just paint this scene for you, so that when these ayat come, we can pass by them quickly, because you'll have all of this background already. You see, the rabbis of that time, they were the ones giving the khutbah, the sermon. They were the ones giving the lectures. They were the ones teaching the religion, yes? And they were the ones giving the fatwa. So everybody who followed the religion, the majority of the Jewish tribes, they would come to the rabbis for their fatawa, for their sermons, for learning the religion, everything. If they accept Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the final messenger, are they going to give fatwa anymore? Is anybody going to attend their lectures anymore? Is their synagogue going to be filled anymore? No. They are going to go from being teachers to being students of Rasulullah sallallahu And they're going to keep their mouth shut because now this is a religion of sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and we obey. Even they're going to be quiet and listen to the Prophet ﷺ. Which means their entire social profile, their reputation in the community. This is the alim, this is the scholar, this is the mufti, this is the khatib. All of a sudden his career is what? Is gone. There's no value left in him. You know? And this is actually a very big part of religious psychology. 
in any religion, when people are in a position of clergy, when they're in a position of sermoning people, teaching people, it's a place of influence. Actually, it's very close to politics. Because a politician influences people, and a religious leader also influences people, and that's why corrupt religious people get very close to politicians. Because they're cousins to each other. You know, they're, they're, they're related to each other. Now these religious people, they had a lot of influence on the people. And of course, when you have influence over the people, you can also ask them for money. And if they're corrupt themselves, eventually somehow or the other money goes in their pockets. And so they'll give the kinds of fatawa and they'll give the kinds of verdicts to people that they want to hear. They'll, they'll even change their religion to suit the public. You know, that's what they used to do. Now this prophet has come along and they know he's the actual prophet, but they know that if they accept him, then the entire population under them will also accept him, which means their business is finished. Because for them, religion had become a business. By the way, I'm talking about the Jewish community of Medina, but I'm not limiting this conversation to Jews or to Medina. Religious leaders in any capacity can turn religion into a business. Very easy. Very easy. And 